you know, whatever. It's your soul. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We look like Jabba the Hutt. Now we can sound like him, too. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 507 of the Dead Robot Society. Terry Mixon here. Joining me, Paul E. Cooley. How you doing, man? I'm tired. Have the I'm weed tired. eaters attacked your, your block yet? Have, have what now? The leaf blowers, the weed eaters. Why would they be attacking me? It's not like I have any recording to do. But no, they have not been attacking me today. Somebody suggested that I should just go ahead and pay people to come around with leaf blowers every day. Yeah, because uh, that wouldn't get me thrown in prison or anything. <laughs> some, you know, some of our listeners are they're mean spirited. I, I hate to say that, but yeah, I can think of a few. <laughs> I can think of a few. Just a few, though. The leaf blower chorus. <sighs> I hate all of you. I hate all of you. Anyway, uh. I got the audiobook sent out to Audible, and they rejected it. Those bastards. All 71 files. They said it's, it's not long enough. You need more words? Nope. Apparently, I screwed up something in the process of recording, and now there's not enough data to do to it what they want done. So there are several files or portions of the book I have to re-record. Damn it. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, just in time for everything else to come crashing down on me when I've I've had this massive writing streak, which has now been broken by all this bullshit. So I have to get all this done when I can get it done because I still need to get it on the market or I'm not making any fucking money out of all this uh, mayhem and misery. Basically, I doubt this book is going to pay for itself. <laughs> I am oh, sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, I uh, I give up. I just fucking give up. Anyway, but the writing is going well when I can get to it. Um, TB4 is rolling along, and and uh, as I said during the pre-show, the the landmines are all, all almost all the landmines are laid, and it's almost time to start setting them off. It's almost. Is time. anyone going to survive? I refuse to answer that question. I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that my fans don't expect me to answer that question. My readers have come to expect that I won't answer that question. And if I do, I'll be lying. So there's no point in even telling you who, you know, what, what I've got planned. The truth is I don't know. That's the truth. I don't know yet, but, uh, yeah, as the writing goes well and, uh, my new process is working very, very well. So I'm happy. I'm very happy. Well, good. Let's see. What have I been doing? I finished a, a story for an anthology, got it sent off. I'm probably three days away from finishing Hidden Enemies, Book Nine in the Empire of Bones, and clicking publish on that. Then I've got two more short stories to write. And then I'll get novel stuff from Glenn Stewart. So Yay. I'm busy, 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 but I'm finally getting projects wrapped up. A busy, busy beaver. <laughs> I'm so shocked. How dare you? It is what it is. <laughs> it never ends, man. It never ends. It's like a little hamster wheel. Is it like a little hamster wheel? Yes, it is. Yeah, you're right. You edit, you publish. You're right. You edit, you publish. You're right. You edit, you publish. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat as often as possible. Well, it sounds like we've both had exciting weeks. Oh, yeah. I'm, and I'm about to make this more exciting for you because I tortured you and made you watch a lecture series. You did. You did. I feel badly about that. You no, should. I don't. No, I don't. You Not at all. Should. You absolutely should feel bad about it. Basically, we watched, an, we watched a lecture series on Heinlein's rules, and I cannot wait to hear what you've got to say about it because I'm sure you have an opinion. I would never have an opinion. And here we go to find out what the, your no opinion is. So, Paul, a few weeks back, maybe a month ago, I challenged you to go ahead and watch a video 
by Dean Wesley Smith on Heinlein's rules of writing. It came with the story bundle, so it was it was free because the bundle was purchased. And we've both watched it. And I have to say that I've been on pins and needles waiting to see exactly how everything worked out for you. Mm. Mm -hmm. First, the most important aspect of this, we have now met somebody that is more curmudgeonly than me. <laughs> I, believe we, I believe I can say that without any fear of contradiction. Yeah, I think that's pretty close to it. Um, <laughs> We did an episode, God, maybe last year on Highlands Rules. I vaguely remember doing it, yes. And uh, we're going to have to revisit them again to talk about what he said. So have you got the list in front of you? I've got the list here in front of me. All right. And I'll go ahead and read it off. I'm not surprised. This is something that for such a simple set of rules, it's a very complex subject. Yeah, I think the lecture was, what, two and a half hours long? Something like that. Something like that. So basically, what happened is Heinlein wrote out these rules of his back in an article published in 1947. So they're a little dated as far as what normally one would expect from this. He was writing it for people that were doing traditional publishing at that point. But it still does have some applicability to us as indies or as hybrid authors. Very briefly, those business habits that he listed were, number one, you must write. Number two, you must finish what you start. Number three, you must refrain from rewriting except to editorial order. Number four, you must put it on the market. And number five, you must keep it on the market until sold. So very brief, very to the point, and incredibly hard to stick to doing it. <laughs> yes. It truly is. Yes. First, let me ask you what your overall impression was of the lecture. He's completely full of shit. You know, I'm sure he's been told that before. <laughs> I think actually it's it's uh it was beneficial. I felt um challenged when I got done with it. Um and it kind of kicked me out of a little bit of a lull and I've, I've been writing pretty heavily since then. So it, it did something. Uh, there's, there's a few things, a few generalizations that I didn't care for. Or I hope I you kept notes. Or I, yes, I did. Or that I think are a little too, uh, general <laughs> generalizations that are too specific for a certain case. Okay. Because there's a lot of gotchas to it, a lot of corollaries, and we we definitely talk about that. But overall, I thought it was it was uh, entertaining, and uh, uh, some good information in there. It was worth the price of entry for having bought a. I think it came with a humble bundle, so one free code to get into a lecture. It was worth the price, right? Yes, definitely, definitely. The lecture, if I remember correctly, he normally sells for seventy five bucks, so. You definitely got your money's worth out of that one. <laughs> yeah. So rule number one, you must write. Seems pretty straightforward. No, he's but... completely wrong. You don't have to write. Oh, you don't uh, have to? to no, be a you're writer. a writer and never writing anything. I see. There's tons of people out there that do just that, which was kind of his point. I, I don't think that they're writers. I think they're wannabe writers at that <laughs> exactly. point. Exactly. That's why I to... take issue with the with the phrase <laughs> aspiring writer. No, you're either writing or you're or you're not. I can I can do that. Now, to be fair, Heinlein used the word aspirant yes. when he was talking about it. That's so different. this this is this aspiring writer and an aspirant are pretty much the same thing in my mind. No, because he was putting it in the context of publishers. Aspiring to be published. I don't know that he was. That's the way I took it. No, I, it's, it's a valid, it's or, certainly valid. I'm not going to argue. aspiring to become a full-time writer. I can buy that too. One of the things that I know when I started out writing is I read a ton of books on writing and I didn't write shit, not for a couple of years. <laughs> so I definitely know how that works. <laughs> Education, the, 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 doing all that is very, very similar to the research hole 
which is they're both great excuses for not writing. And you, even with code, I've, I've been the proponent that you cannot learn it unless you're writing it. Just can't. The theoretical stuff doesn't, doesn't mean jack shit until you actually get in there and figure out what it is you're dealing with. And then you realize what you don't know. I know that when I took programming classes in college, this was after I'd worked at NASA for a while and was pursuing a, a bachelor's degree, which I never finished, by the way. I'd, I'd have no desire to be a programmer. You're welcome to the damn thing. But when I took the, the entry-level programming courses, it became obvious to me that something was missing. There was I had to try to figure out what I wasn't getting that the teacher was giving that everybody else understood. Mm. There was some basic fundamental piece of it for object oriented programming that I did not have because I was a script monkey. Yeah, that could be a problem. So that I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> and he wasn't uh, telling me what I didn't know. Yeah. And, and, and there you go. And that's why you read. That's why you read uh, other people's code. That's why you look at the source code for stuff instead of just how it works or or what it does. You go and see how it works. Writing That's is the true same of writing thing. too. Writing yeah. is exactly the same thing. When you're reading a book, like I mean, I've said this before. I I try and read a book for pleasure the first time, and then second time through, if there's something I want to revisit because it struck me a certain way, I will go look at it. I will go see how far that theme translates or whatever it is they did and see how they did it because it obviously worked. And so I want to know how it worked. And that's, that's, I mean, reading is studying. Reading is always going to be studying. And I think it, once you are dealing with words on a daily basis and you're actually writing for that stuff, then reading becomes even more important in some ways because hopefully it can break you out of some of your bad habits, but because that's your craft. If you're a musician, you're going to study other other music. And that's just, I mean, it's the same exact thing. You're going to listen to new sounds people have created and say, wow, I like that. I want to incorporate it. It's exactly the same thing with your writing, that descriptive was, line or phrase. Yeah, and it can even be more macro than that. I recently read a new book by an author named Karen Chance who writes urban fantasy. And it's the third book in a series, and it's been years since this particular, I'm going to call it a sub-series because it's part of her overall universe and a bunch of the characters there that are secondary in these novels are primary in, different, in a different series that does quite well. So I was glad to see her come back and visit this particular sub-series. And as I was reading the book, it occurred to me just exactly how well she kept upping the, the crap factor that the character was having to wade through. When things got worse, they didn't just get worse. They got really worse. And then they got really worse from there. And it was like a stair stepper of, well, what, what's going to go wrong now that's going to just up everything and make this just more of a shit show for her to deal with, the main right. character to deal with. Yeah. And I'm going to go back and reread that to see exactly how she did that because it struck me that I enjoyed how well the game just kept getting up until it was just basically ludicrous at the end, the amount of shit that she had to deal with. <laughs> and and that's what I like. That, those are the kinds of things I'm looking for. Um, I want, I want to see how the interaction worked. I want to see what these authors are doing just to get an idea of what they're doing that I'm not, you know, and see if it's something I want to try. You have to write. Let's get back on point. On point? Wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to chase all these bunnies that try and keep us from writing. Well, like we there's just all did. of those. There's there's that too, but there are other reasons why we don't write. We're afraid. We're afraid that people are going to read it and they're going to say, this is crap. We're afraid that a publisher is going to get our submission and send his thugs to our house to, to basically spank our ass like Jay and Silent Bob. <laughs> Yeah, Dean Wesley Smith's little comment on that was really hilarious. Uh, I don't remember what did he say. That. Nobody's going to come to your house and shoot you. Yeah, it was it was literally one of these deals. I can't send this to a publisher. They're going to hate me. It's going to ruin my reputation. You have to have a reputation to ruin. And the only way you're going to have a reputation to ruin is to write the goddamn book. 
And also the way editors work, the moment your story doesn't work for them, it off it goes. Side. And they side. go through so many stories, they wouldn't remember you from Adam. Yeah, I thought the the interesting part was, or one of the interesting stories in there was he's talking about they have their own publishing company and they invited some new writers and some some other folks in their stable to come help them read the slush pile. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catherine Rush apparently was like, well, you can just read the first paragraph and know if it's a book that's, that's going to be any good. And one of the writers went, no, you got to give him more of a chance than that. He was through maybe his seventh or eighth manuscript and was tossing them aside anyway after he gave, quote unquote, gave them a chance. And she finally went over there and said, uh, all right, I'll tell you what, for each book that you give a chance, I'll read the first paragraph and tell you how it ends. And according to him, she was right 100% of the time, and all those manuscripts got rejected. She's a, a Hugo winning editor. Yeah. So she's she's the real deal when it comes to that. She's got mad skills when it comes to that. So the you know, the idea that you're gonna get it perfect out of the box for everybody is just bullshit. It's just not gonna happen. Um that that's so there's no point in worrying about it. You have to write the damn story, which means you have to write. I know that I'm not as good at reading stories like that. I know that I've been involved in selecting which things get added to the to a potential accept pile and which ones are rejected from something before. And it's not the first paragraph, but I certainly didn't get more than a couple of pages before I went, nope, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. Yeah. Usually you, you can tell that pretty early from the submission process, but that's another rule altogether. But I can tell you one thing right now, all of the ones that I said, nope, I haven't, even though I'm not an editor that doesn't see a billion of these, I don't remember a single name. I don't remember the title. I don't remember the author. I got nothing. As soon as I rejected it, it was out of my head. And it's going to be that way for everybody else that you send your stuff to. And it's going to be that way for readers that don't like the sample that you put out. They'll give you a shot. They'll move on if they don't like what they see. They won't remember you tomorrow. No. You're not going to ruin your career by publishing something that someone doesn't like. Now that reader may never come back if they get to your ending and you killed off everybody. That's a totally different issue there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a completely different issue. But the rule is get in the chair and write. You have to do it. You, you have to write. It. Because if you let yourself get sidetracked by any of the other important things, like I've been letting myself get detracted, subtracted, Detracted, distracted, distracted. My all God. of the, all of the, all of the tracted words. It's John's word. You need to look <laughs> into it. What? I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> it's, it's an easy rabbit hole to fall down to say, oh, this is more important. I need to do this one little thing. I need to do that. You have to jealously guard your writing time like a dragon against all outside distraction. And all internal distraction as well. And I am as guilty of it as everyone else. And I've got 15 books published. And I'm quite sure that people that have 10 times as many books published can find themselves in the same boat. This is not something you get over. This is not something you work your way around. It's something that is going to be a continuing struggle because it's not easy. Your brain, if it's not wanting to do something, will come up with excuses of why you should be doing something else. And you've got to fight that. You've got to protect the time to produce because if you don't produce new words, nothing else matters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Number two, you must finish what you start. <clears throat> have you, have you ran into that problem before Paul? <clears throat> Yes and no. Yes and no. I have gone back. Um, flames. Ended up finishing going back after it lingered around for four years. Uh, I'm finally working on evolution again, which is languished for two years or a year and a half, two years, something like that. 
And uh, let's see, what else am I getting back to? Quantum personality disorders going back and forth. So am I going to finish all those books? Yes. Am I working on one primarily right now? Yes. But I do go back and my, my challenge to myself is one to 2,000 words a day on TB4 and then I get playtime with the other books. And frequently I'm finding myself writing 3,500 words on TB4 and nothing else. And uh, so I'm split. I'm giving myself the option to split, you know, switch back and forth, give myself that option. But it, and, and that's keeping me fresh. That's keeping me fresh. And some wins on TB4 allowed me to go start this really complicated part of quantum personality disorder, which is terrifying as hell because I don't know how it's going to work yet. Uh, but it allowed me to go do that scene and doing that scene allowed me to go back to TB4 and slug through some more of this bullshit and try and make it as interesting as possible. So uh, it, it, the, the, the back and forth has been good for me. Okay. And I should have mentioned with the previous one that you shall write knocks out 90% of the aspirants. Yeah. He gives a list of what he figures the number of people will, will, will drop out who say, I want to be a writer. He used a, a proverbial 1 million author pool to start with. Right. And there goes 900,000 people. There goes 900,000. I don't remember the, I don't remember the specifics of how many are dropped out at everyone after this, but the first one gets almost everybody that thinks they want to be a writer. Yeah. And, and I can certainly see how that works. <laughs> if that doesn't kill them, rule two does. Rule two does. I'll have to confess that I looked maybe a year and a half ago to see what I had that was unfinished. I've got part of a romance novel that I wrote 20,000 words on and got distracted and, and went somewhere else. And then I decided I wasn't writing erotic romance anymore. So it's not done. Maybe a couple of things that I wrote a couple of chapters on and wasn't satisfied with them. They were just exploratory ideas that I never went anywhere with. I pretty much finish anything that I start. Let's see. What haven't I finished? I haven't finished track nine, Necroshine. Necroshine. Um, Necroshine, yeah. Ooh, you know, that's, <laughs> ooh, that sounds dirty. I'm probably going to write that as a short novel. I'm probably due to, if I cut it down to 40 grand, I think I'll be, be happier. Uh, the Day the Town Died, have never finished that one. Um, but I really want to because it's a Garaga Western. Uh, but let's see. What else have I not finished? uh signal decay which i put a significant investment on so i've got several and some of these have been languishing for like five or six years the day that down the town died and and necroshine have been languishing at least that long so those are books that probably i'll revisit uh in the near future but for right now probably because i can get them done fairly quickly because they're not really complex but uh, I'd like to get them done. I'd like to get them out there, but they're horror. You know, they're, they're, they're horror. Although I guess technically you could say that uh, bleh, the day the town died is urban fantasy set in the West. I don't even know how that works. How does that genre work? That genre mashup. I don't even know how to describe it. Um, what do they call those things? Strange Westerns. They've got, I can't remember precisely what they call them, but they're, there is a specific genre of Westerns that includes supernatural elements. Hmm. Okay. Because I've seen a couple of, of anthologies and stories dealing with exactly that. So it would fit into whatever that is. It's not urban fantasy. Right. Okay. Anyway, the bottom line is I go back and I finish as much as I can, as much as I want to, and as much as where my brain is. And I've had to work on more profitable properties of mine in the past couple of years than working on my uh, other projects. And so it's, it's pushed kind of everything around, but I will get back there. It's just a matter of, I am finishing what I'm starting. It's just taking a while because I've got other projects that kind of take precedent because they, uh, they pay the bills. Yeah. I, we didn't specifically ask, but you've got notes of things that you wanted to dispute were there any in the first section that that we didn't actually tag onto? Because I didn't ask. His rule, his rule two. Okay, where that's where we are. Rule two, or maybe that was rule three. I can't remember. His, uh, I think he talks about this. His spell check and just send it out. 
This is one also of the things the that he does that that we that he for years he was just not clear. He would say that's what he did, but it's not what he did. And he's learned that he's leaving an important part out when he's talking to people. This lecture doesn't cover that. He does something called cycling. He writes the story, and as he's going along, he'll write five, six hundred words, and then he'll go back about that amount, read through it creatively as he's doing it, and stay in the creative voice, make little tweaks here, add things, delete things, expand on things, and then hit where he stopped and just keep on rolling. And when he gets to the end, then he's done. He runs the spell check on it, but he's actually gone through it twice. Right. That's, that's, and that's, that's, his, that's his, important. <laughs> his way to go. Yeah. That's an important fact or, or part of this. And he used to, it, it took me personally years to drag that information out of him because I'm going, I'm not getting something. There is no way that you're writing this and you're done when you're done. It's not happening. Yeah. And I finally got him to explain what, his cycling was, and it was like a light bulb going off my head. That's pretty similar to what I do. I've been trying his version of cycling. It's not working out for me because it keeps knocking me out of creative voice when I have to go back. So I'm going to be one of those people that I can do this. He's, he would say I can't because he's a curmudgeon. He's wrong. I can do this. I go back to the beginning after I finish writing the story in creative voice, and I get back into it, not in editorial, but as the reader, still in the creative voice, and I work my way through from beginning to end because that's how my OCD linear voice actually works. I did this for the first half dozen books. They turned out fine. They're going to turn out fine when I go back to doing it this way. Yes. I would also put on here that his spell... It, this is what I have written down. Okay. His spell check, spell check it and send it out will not work with a series that needs lots of continuity checks. Well, he does work. use, he, he does use a copy editor. With yes, his own, with his own about, work. I'm talking about continuity with plot lines, uh, canon, things like that. Once you get along far enough, that does become an issue. I've got a, a gentleman that acts as a first reader that he's, he's pretty good about keeping track with that sort of thing, but I still make mistakes. Continuity errors still happen. Yeah. And they're Guess going what? to regard you make it. You'll yeah. make it anyway, because you'll discover you've accidentally changed the name of a planet three books back and no one noticed. Or no kill the same one noticed. Twice. Kill, kill, kill the same character twice. Uh, misname is ship. Yeah. Which he, you and I have both done now. <laughs> <laughs> and most of the readers won't even catch it. Or if yeah. they do catch it, they'll go up. Oh, he made a mistake there. And they just, Continue to march. As and, long as you're telling an yeah. a good story that you're staying down in the depth of the story, something like that, a little oops is not going to knock them completely out of the story. You're going to be fine. A big oops will. A big oops is a problem. But I would hope to God that I would know when I have a really big oops. And, that, and that's part of what I was talking about here is that if I encounter something in my book that or i've i've written a new plot line which erases that old plot line or that then you're stuck with having to go through the book doing the editing pass and finding those things and nuking them but since i'm intending to do that in the first place that works for me yes i could exactly. just make a note of make a note to myself in second pass look for this correct and that's what i do too in a lot of places if if it's not in the same chapter and it's not in the same scene if it's in the same chapter, same scene, I will fix it then. I will go back. For example, this book that I just finished, I was originally calling it Clan Wars. The ending name is now going to be Hidden Enemies. But uh, I decided that I had a romance subplot in it, but the characters didn't spend enough time together in the last half of the novel. I, I, The plot took them apart. So that became unreasonable. So I had to go back and I immediately, as soon as I made the decision, no, I can't have that in there. I went back and I pulled and rewrote everything that I could find that had to do with that. I immediately went back and searched for it. Most cases that was rewriting a couple of paragraphs here, a couple of paragraphs there. I had to rewrite, I had to throw one scene out pretty much and write a new scene 
to replace it with. That's got most of it. I'm sure that I missed a mention somewhere. That's what I'm going to catch on the second pass through is the little bitty mentions that I might not have, have caught. Right. And that, and that's, that, that's part of the trick is, you know, if it's something I can't remember that I did in book one or two, like I'm, I still have to go back every once in a while and go look at arrival or outbreak and make sure I remember that I laid that landmine, what that landmine was. And now we're going to make it go off. In my story Bible, I've got a page set aside for, for plot hooks that I've never used. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. And when I'm getting to a new book, I'll look back at that and go, is there anything in this list that I can, can revisit? <laughs> or can I make a book out of this? Which I have done. Which you I've, have taken done. A, I've taken a plot hook that I set somewhere earlier and used it later a couple of times. Yeah. And I think you discover those things when you go back and, and read it as a reader. I think you find those places, and I don't really think you can find them any other way than reading the whole manuscript. It's true, and that becomes a problem if you've got nine books in the yes. series. Yes, and that, that's why I'm saying <laughs> what he says in Rule 2, some of it's a crock of shit because it just will not work in certain cases. I understand why he made the generalization. But there's a lot of caveats and there's a lot of corollaries and there's a lot one of the of things. things that that should be kept in mind with his writing is while he has series, almost all of them involve his, his main series. He calls his. Um, well, I'm not I'm not going to get it. There's a couple of series that he has. Only now are they starting to get four or five books in that series with the same characters. Yeah. He used to he he wrote a series of books in his Thunder Mountain universe, which is Western science fiction, basically. But every time it would be a different pair of characters because he writes with the romance style of writing. So it would always be a new pair of characters. The universe would stay the same, but the characters themselves would swap out. They would be different. And I think he's only now starting to run into series where he's reusing the same main characters. And he may not have totally got that into his head yet. <laughs> it's it's tough. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. And the finish what you write here. Here's the really horrible truth. The longer you wait to write that that next book in the series, the more shit you're going to forget. Oh, that's totally true. I meant to write the uh, second book in my post apocalyptic series. It's now been roughly two years. Guess who's going to be rereading that book? Because hell, this this book that I finished, just starting back through it, I'm making I have a page of notes of going, oh, I did this with these characters. I forgot these characters even existed. I guess I should write that down. <laughs> I can only imagine what one from two years ago is like. Yeah, and and you know it's it's funny because the last black book I wrote was Outbreak, and Outbreak has, I mean, you never see what kicks off this whole mess because it happens in the black, but the ramifications stream down. But that means I have to remember what happened in each book, how the creature changed between each book. And then I'm having to go back and explain how the scientists discover why that is. If only we would know ahead of time that we need to make <laughs> detailed notes about all of these things when we're writing it. <laughs> well, I do now. Yeah, we do now, now that it's far too late to do oh, us any good. Too late. One of the things I'm doing with quantum personality disorder is I am keeping the the notes on the side. And there's been several times where I've written a, a paragraph and gone, that doesn't belong here, but I need to use that paragraph as a plot point later on. Or somebody needs to say this and we need to discuss this, but here is not the place. I can see using Scrivener where doing note cards attached to something with detailed information like that would be useful. It is. It's invaluable at times. It really helps you during the editing phase. It really does help you. So you finish what you write. Uh, we're both guilty of not. To a degree. To a degree. I think that we are much better at finishing what we start than the vast majority of people. Because oh, yeah, you, how many books? Fine. How many books do you have published? Plenty. Yes. How many books do I not have published that are complete? Four. And they will never see the light of day. <laughs> Not a single one of them. And that's okay. 
Um, and that, that has to do with time and, and the fact that I'm, I, I'm older and more experienced now. I don't even want to go back and read those damn things. So My it, wife keeps encouraging me to go back and look at the uh, novels I wrote when I first started out, when I was writing under a pen name, writing erotic mysteries. Nope, not interested. Thanks. <laughs> I'm so much better as a writer right now. I yeah. do not even want to look at it. I did. I, I, I say that I have one completely finished and edited novel that is an erotic mystery that is never going to see the light of day. It's completely done, completely finished, completely ready. And then I change genres and I'm not going to publish it. What a slacker. Because I, I would have to go back. I want, if I wanted to write that, I would have to go back and yank the explicit content and expand on the mystery stuff. It's only 60,000 words long and it could use, it's still not my best work. It was done right as I made the jump over to writing science fiction and before I wrote uh, Empire of Bones. So it's 15 books ago at this point. 15 books ago. Isn't that scary shit? That is scary shit. I, I was actually things? thinking about I was actually thinking about that the other day. I was like, well, I haven't really written that many books. And then I started going through them and went, wait a minute. <laughs> actually, I've written quite a few. The the number gets bigger. If I didn't keep track of it in like book report, <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't know. <laughs> I've written 13 <laughs> on my own and co-written, actually, I think I think I've written 12 on my own and co-written three. Oh yeah, the co-written works. Yeah, and I keep. So when I say those. fifteen, you know, maybe maybe it would be easier saying thirteen and a half. Thirteen and a half. <laughs> I wrote half a book. Oh, huh? yeah. Anyway, uh, other than that, I thought the the his uh, um, remonstrations were good, accurate, and needed to be said. I I envision that we're going to get lots of Paul pushback on number three. I bet he's got like this host of notes on number three, which yeah. is you must refrain from rewriting except to editorial order. Here's where Paul explodes. Let's see the, I go back and fix it. Yeah. If you can remember where the fucking plot hole is, it might be in another chapter that you have to place it, or it might be that you have to set that up in two or three places. So there's some luxuries described here that I don't think some writers have. That's what I wrote down. That's that's entirely possibly true. Entirely it's, possibly true? It, it is it, true. It really depends on the writer. I'm not going to say it's 100% true. I can usually go back and fix most mentions of something that I've changed because it's something simple, like the name of something. Yes. I can fix those kind of things. Yes. A big thing, like I'm yanking out the romance subplot. Oh, that's a little tougher. <laughs> or I found that I want to do this and I have to go back and set it up. That's actually pretty easy to do, I think. For the Depends. things that I do, it's pretty easy. Well, it may be easy for you. Um, in some and cases. I'm, and I'm, I'm being specific here. Yes. For the type of writing that I do, yeah. going back and putting uh, a foreshadowing is usually not so hard for me. It just depends. It really just depends. Sometimes I have to go back and I have to add things in three different places in the book. Three completely different separate chapters where separate characters notice something because I need all of them to see it. Yours is a more complex and nuanced sort of thing than I write. Mine is pretty straightforward and simple. It, it's, it doesn't get more simplistic than my writing <laughs> when you get right down to it. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's just, I like, I, I guess basically I'm writing mysteries and mystery suspense requires those kinds of things. If you're going to do it right, it just does. It does. And those are the kind of stories I like to write. So yes, we're going to have different, uh, different things on this. What flames for instance, okay. was no problem because it was, it is a very linear tale and we don't see there's really only three points of view. So, things narrow down. And I think the more, the, the fewer points of view you have, the less this is an issue also. So like I said, there's some caveat. Overall, I understand what he's saying. And if I'm writing a straight ahead novel, then it's pro it'll probably work for me. But with Derelict or The Black or Garaga, forget it. <laughs> forget it. 
but still, I think there was some good advice in there. Any other caveats? That's that's one written caveat here. Do you have more for this particular segment? He, except when rewriting it to editorial, I like I said, I think that that is mostly a good point. However, if you're a beginning writer, beginning novelist, uh, there may be some some things some things you need to learn first before you can do this confidently and professionally i think That's that i'm going to disagree with you here on this point simply because the time that you improve yourself as a writer isn't inside a book it's when you've finished a book and you're moving on to the next one if you go back and you continually rewrite pieces parts inside the work that you're con that you're currently working on you're going to flatten out your own creative voice in doing so. It's like art. You've got to do the best you can and move on to the next project. That's my personal opinion as far as that goes. What he's talking about rewriting, I think, is, you know, when you're seriously going back and you think, oh, you know, this is just not so great. I need to go back through it line by line. And this is not aimed at you because I know that you do this, Paul. I'm not saying it in that way. Because you do go back through it line by line and and do things when you're editing. And let me finish the thought before I forget about it. This is not at you, but a lot of people will go through their editing process and they'll take out their own authorial voice because you can't hear your own voice as you're going your stuff bland. You'll make yourself, your characters and your, your setting sound like everyone else's because you're going through and you're pulling out all the unique ways of saying things in a story and i believe that's what he's warning against yes i think that is what he's warning right you've got to avoid screwing over your own voice how many times and have you heard the joke about the um well maybe you've never heard it there was an old joke in the english department and uh one of the profs actually told it which is you walk into a professor's office and you're you get to know them and everything and you look up one day and you see this this bundle of stuff on a top shelf. They're like, what's that? Oh, it's my novel. Is there any, you know, what are you doing with it? Nothing. Why not? It's shit. I need to rewrite it. Okay. How long have you been working on this? Oh, it's been worked on for the past decade. And I'm just like, the fuck are you writing? War and peace? What are you doing here? Or you meet the writer who write rewrites four or five times. I mean, the whole story four or five times that needs to quit. You can't do it. It's just too much. You will never get on. And I, I totally agree with you about the learning part. You learn while you're writing that you apply it to the next book. That's the way I look at it. But sometimes I will be in the middle of a book and realize that I have got to fix this now, or I'm going to have to go fix it later, which is either I've found myself doing too many uh, really obnoxious taglines here and there or something on those lines, I go back and I, I will nuke it right then. And every once in a while, there's a, an annoying sentence that rhymes three effing times and I want to get rid of it because I don't want to read it on the audio book. So uh, there, there's, there's a little stuff like that, but I don't sit there and torture myself over every paragraph. That would be ludicrous. You, you make it sound like you do, though, sometimes. Well, it's different when you're editing for audio. That's the problem. When I'm actually speaking it aloud, you, I notice things, they jump out at me, and they're horrible. And it's just, I feel so stupid saying them. I'm just like, I can't do this. I've got to rewrite this sentence. Or I can't pronounce it. It, it, it's just a serious issue, but no, I do not go back and torture it line by line. If I'm, you know, doing actual book edits, I don't do that. No, I don't. I used to do that when I was younger, but I don't torture every sentence. So there are some times where the narrator voice gets kind of cagey and I have to kind of go back and look at it. But it depends on how manic I am that day or depressed. Either the, the narrator's voice, as a matter of fact, or the narrator gets sarcastic. It's really funny. But it's little stuff like that that I'll catch. But no, I do not go back and rewrite the damn story 12 times. Well, I don't think that you rewrite it, but it, you, you pay a lot more attention to the sin and, and the specifics than I do. That much I know is true. Yes. And that's fine. 
That's that's perfectly fine. That's not what I was talking about when we were doing this. Yeah. Um. I I, I wonder what it's going to be like for you when you move the audio engineering section out. Probably very different. Probably very different. I think it's going to change the process and everything else. We'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm considering doing the finishing up derelict and finishing up the black, but we'll see. It just depends on how bad my hearing gets between now and then. So, but regardless, things are going to change. They're going to have to. They're just going to have to. My hearing is getting bad enough to where it's time for me to go ahead and and get your hearing aids, steal them off of your dead body or whatever. Oh, good. Now you're planning on killing me. Good luck. <laughs> good luck understanding how to put the YouTube episodes together there, buddy. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that. Good luck. Yeah. With that. No, I mean, I'm with that hospital stay. Who knows? I may actually, you know, be close to my, my out of pocket amount. So maybe it won't cost me an arm and a leg. Yeah, maybe not. We'll see. Regardless things. Yes. For me are going to have to change and I'm sure some of my writing is going to change as a result. Any other thoughts on rule three? I, I mean, think, I, I think basically, you know, he's dead on, especially if you're writing the first book, don't do it. One of the things that may be different than what he was talking in there is a lot of what he was talking and especially Hein was talking related to traditional publishing. These days we are the creators and the publishers. So in effect, we're our own editorial order to a certain extent. Yes. Even to if a certain you have, extent. even if you have a copy editor, you're still responsible for a ton of the production stuff. And that means that you have to, you, you do have to have the discipline to go, okay, maybe that's not going to work. One of the things that I found writing for myself is that not rewriting except to editorial order means that when I get to the end of the book, I just have to trust my inner storyteller. Sometimes it's led me astray. <laughs> and well, there you are. No, you've never been led astray. I've never been led astray. It's never you happened. Just, you learn from it and you move on. You learn from don't, it and you move on. Don't dwell on how your book is going to be received because you are not a judge of your own writing. If you're like any other professional writer, you look at your own writing, you go, this is shit. This is crap because you can't hear your own voice. It sounds just like the inside of your head when you're writing. So there's nothing unique about it. Whereas everybody else that's reading your work, they can see the voice that is you and they will get things out of it that you never intended to be there. And that's, but you can't dwell. You cannot dwell on whether you think there's any quality in the work. Judging quality is not your job as a creator. That's the, the recipient. That's the reader. Or if it's visual art, that's the person that's interpreting what you've written. Leave the judgment to someone else and just write the damn book and then move on to the next one. Unless the first thing you put down is the three page info dump, in which case you need to slap yourself silly. Well, sure. And of course, if you start on a, it was a dark and stormy night, that's a totally different issue. <laughs> I still remember all the peanuts cartoons with that in it. That's that was his favorite Schultz's favorite go to. Was it Snoopy totally was. To write a book. It was absolutely hilarious. Dear publisher, there's obviously been a misunderstanding. <laughs> I sent you my manuscript with the intention that you would send me lots of money. Please correct this problem. Or the other one, I don't understand the restraining order it got on so and so to date. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> there's actually a scene like that in in uh, uh, the Netflix is uh, um, a series of unfortunate events. Where the guys responded to correspondence, and that's one of the things he says is so damn funny. He's talking about some poetry, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I don't understand this restraining order I received on such and such. I'm sure it was a mistake. I thought we were friends. <laughs> <It's> like, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes along with rule number four. Rule number four. You must put it on the market. I cannot tell you. Back in the traditional days, how many people finish something 
and then said, oh, this is crap, which is referring back to what we just talked about, and they don't send it somewhere. Or they send it to a couple of places, they become discouraged, and they don't keep sending it out. Those were the traditional days. Back then, you had to pick five markets, send it out. When you get the rejections back, that's just short stories. Pick five more markets, whatever, you, whatever you're going to do. Or maybe just, just one market at a time. But the latest advice that I saw Dean give for short stories was, if you're going to submit it to the traditional short story market, you keep sending it out for two years. You yeah. send it out to one place. You send it out to another place. You send it out. To pl- as soon as you get a rejection back, you send it out. Because there's no telling for taste. Somebody's going to read it and go, eh, not for me. Not right for this this anthology. Not right for this. And then somebody's going to go, this is the best shit ever. And they're going to buy it. You just can never guess. Sure. It's all a matter of taste because all editors are, are readers. They really are. They know what they want. They read for it. And they buy it. If you're If you're submitting short stories to the traditional market, if you're submitting novels to the traditional market, you've got to have perseverance. When you get rejected, it's nothing personal. You move on. You find somebody else. If it had a, after a couple of three years, you haven't gotten success with it, publish it indie. Move on to the next thing at that point. But you can't just give up. You've got to do something with it. And you've got to keep doing something with it until it's out on the market. Yeah. The one thing I thought was really interesting when you said traditional publishing, I remember when I was in my early 20s, and sending out the book would cost like three bucks in postage. Mm-hmm. That was back in 1994 or five. I mean, I had all these manuscript boxes. You had to print the damn thing out. I mean, submitting a novel was expensive if they wanted the whole manuscript. It was expensive. Guess what? Those days, for the most part, are gone. Yeah. Probably 90, 90% out there, everything's electronic and it doesn't matter. There are still a few holdouts that I've seen. And I think that's mainly because they want to deal with agents. They don't want to deal with the you know, slush pile, so to speak. The but old world they, of publishing is going through upheaval. I'm not going to say that it's dying, but it's definitely on life support. It's been in a weird place for a while now. And, uh, Facebook basically told the publishers, we don't give a shit if you go out of business. Here's our rules. You better follow them. Uh, I think you meant Amazon. No, I was talking about Facebook. Why would Facebook tell publishers? Because they have created their own new pipeline. Oh, I guess I'm not aware of this. Yes. I don't understand how it works, but basically they came out and that was the gist of their message. I'll try and remember and and post the link to the article. Anyway, regardless. The bottom line is that we've watched this disruption since shit. I don't know. When did it start? 2007, eight? I think so. That's when the Kindle first started coming out was seven or eight, something like that. Kindle actually came out before that. But when we really started Indies take, see Indies taking the stage was 2008, 2009 was when it really started blowing up. I think you could be right. It's been, it's been about 10 years. Be that as it may. The upheaval is still in process. It hasn't ended. It's a process. Progress. It's still in progress. Even though things have kind of quieted down in some areas and it's not as insane as it used to be, it's just cluttered now. There's a sense of of inevitability. Inevitability. Because Barnes & Noble is going out of business. Not right this second. But every single quarter, they lose money. How long can that particular dance go on before they close their doors? They're trying to switch it out and go to smaller bookstores with smaller footprints. They keep swapping out what they're going to sell inside these. If and when that happens, traditional publishing is going to lose the last large-scale bookseller that they have as a customer. Because for traditional publishers, the reader is not their customer. The bookstore is. That's how their marketing is set up. That's how their distribution is set up. When Barnes & Noble goes out of business, things are going to change. I think the... I think the other thing is going to happen because of that. And, And it's already happened. I mean, Amazon, I think Amazon between their... 
the book side they actually sell and the Kindle side, they have some absolutely obscene market share. Absolutely obscene market share for how many books that they are selling and how many people are using them as a primary distributor. I believe if we're just talking print books, that selling through Amazon, the print versions is over 50% at yeah. this particular point of the market. Right. For ebooks, it's over 70%. So then you go look at who are the secondary market Walmart, Target, grocery stores, the big box stores. Big box stores and things like airline cubicles. That's I mean, that's that's pretty much the the secondary market outside of the uh, of, out of Barnes and Nobles and bookstores, mm -hmm. non non electronic non Amazon bookstores. The upheaval that's going to happen is Amazon's going to get knocked off its perch. We don't know what's going to happen, but it will happen. If pardon me, while I give you a squirrely look, where did you get to that point? I I don't think I follow. Because it's nobody stays on top forever. This is true. But the fact that Barnes and Noble goes out of business is not going to knock Amazon off of its perch. No, no, no. That's no, no, no. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is there is an upheaval coming. I don't know when and I don't know what. That's why it's called an upheaval. <laughs> well, there, there, at, there will be a, a significant change to the status quo. I don't know what's gonna what, what's gonna drive it or what it is, but it will come. The first big significant change I think that we're going to see as I put on my Karnak the Magnificent hat to go ahead and and uh, figure this out is it's going to be the failure of Barnes & Noble. It's going to be the closure of that, which is going to be a boon to independent booksellers. They're not going out of business anytime soon. And when the last box store goes out of business, they're going to flourish. They're already in the process of flourishing from where they were at their lowest point just five years ago. They're already in a lot of lot better shape, independent bookstores are. And that's only going to continue to grow, I suspect. Because they're not directly competing with Amazon like Barnes and Noble was. No, they're they're also they're they're competing on service. They're competing on a different level. They are it's their own experience. little niche markets and they are the hand selling types that that cater to a specific audience. And they're not going to be harmed when Barnes and Noble goes out of business. They are going to be helped by that. Um I forgot where I was going with this, but that's Barnes and Noble's going out of business is going to be the next big upheaval. When the next upheaval after that comes around, I don't know. Amazon is certainly dancing along, trying to make sure that that never happens. Eventually they're going to fail. But at this particular point, I don't see it happening soon. It's the same dance that Google's got with YouTube and media creators. What they're doing is they're making it they're making it less and less profitable for content creators to actually put their stuff up. And that is ultimately going to lead to a problem. And That's I don't true. know how we're going to get around it, but it's going to have to, it's going to maybe things like Patreon, not necessarily Patreon. We were expecting it to do that, but they turned out to kind of be douchebags. But the, the fact that people can now come and say, I'm going to give you three bucks a month. Give me a story every month kind of deal. Or I want to support this. You know, how do I keep you creating these con this content? That's been going on for a while, but I think that kind of patronage model is going to pick up steam as as uh, more and more readers discover just how effed the rest of us are getting. I think you're right. I think that Amazon, at some point in the future, is going to do something that cuts into what content creators are getting at this particular point. And when that happens, places like Kobo will suddenly expand in market share. Yeah, absolutely. As people say, you know, F you Amazon. It's going to be challenging to figure out for Amazon how to balance that, wanting to make more money from the content creators without giving the competition an edge. And that's... that's that what's really going to hurt them is their own words. Because when they were in this big negotiation with this big public spat with traditional publishers a few years back, Amazon outright said, you should give content creators 70%, 35% to the creator, 35% to the publisher. You should only take 30%. They said those words in black and white. And those, those particular words will come back to haunt Amazon as soon as they change. Oh, yeah, we, oh yes, I agree. I completely agree. And when it happens, it's going to be ugly. 
So just keep that in mind. But the bottom line is the, you know, keep the stuff on the market, the short stories, novels, whatever. Uh, I have several novels that sell maybe 15, 20 copies a year. Um, that's all, you know, closet treats, Garaga stuff, things like that. They just don't sell, which is fine. But I keep them up there. I keep them up there. They're my indie works. I can't really resell them to any publishers or anything like that because they're already out in the in the uh, in the marketplace. But they're there, and occasionally I see somebody's come through, or a couple of somebody's have come through and read the whole book on Kindle Unlimited. So they're still there, and people are still reading them. And uh, there's no reason not to keep those things up. There's no reason. Yeah, it's what's going to happen in the market is going to happen in the market nothing ever stays the same for me, somebody that's, that's selling solely through Amazon. I know that I'm taking a risk. It's a calculated risk that if I go wide and sell my books elsewhere and take it out of Kindle unlimited, I'm going to take a big financial hit. It's hard to make yourself do that kind of thing. But if Amazon decides to make their marketplace significantly less profitable, there's going to be a large outflow of people and it's going to help create another market. That's how the free market works. That's probably when you get to get to a point where it's going to become more of an author co-op. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see how that works. I've been in one of those before. We'll see if, if it changes to an online digital co-op. We'll see how that works. But regardless, you got to get the shit out there and you've got to try and sell it. If you're going to go traditional, you have to get it out there. You just have to. Otherwise, nobody's ever going to see it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Any other things you wrote down for rule number four? No, that was pretty much it. I, I very much agreed with a lot of what he said. Rule number five, you must keep it on the market until it sells. That's a tough one. I talked about that earlier, that people grow tired of being rejected they find reasons to not keep putting it out there. They don't indie publish it. It's the final nail in the coffin for that last sliver of people that have gotten all the way through this, that have created their content and been brave enough to send it out to somebody. You've got to keep it there. You've got to keep it either published indie, put it out there, fire and forget, move on to the next project. Or if you're deciding that you want to do something with a traditional publisher, you've got to keep sending it out. You can't let yourself get bogged down. You've got to just grit your teeth, work your way through it, and keep sending it out rejection after rejection or publish it indie. I would say one of the caveats to that is get it edited, get it beta read before you do that. I think that that's important as well, but that's actually further up in the process than we are right now it is but i would say that if you're you need to make sure you do that you can't just slap it together and put it out yeah don't do like terry did <laughs> do not do like terry did <laughs> all right that's rule five right that is rule five there's kind of an un unwritten rule six is that if a few years down the road you have to look at it again and decide if you're going to refresh the cover, make it relevant to the market as it is today, because things change. Once you've published it indie, this is more particular indie than anything else, but you've got to go ahead and make sure that it's still relevant, that the cover hasn't become dated, that the blurb has not is, is not something trashy. You can maybe do better now that you've had a lot more experience writing blurbs. Maybe you're going to retouch the blurb, but definitely looking at the parts that become dated and bringing them up to date is something that is a written unrule number six. Refresh as needed. But don't continually just refresh. I'm not talking the content. Here. I know I know what okay. you're talking just about. Just making sure that I, about, I thought I'd say that. Yeah. But I'm also talking about covers and things like that. This is something where if you've got something out there and it's selling, leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, don't tweak it. If you've got something out there that sold for a good long while and has finally trailed off into nothing, it's time to rebrand. It's time to look at your, your covers and say, could I do something better here with this that would bring this back to life? If it's, if it's got life, 
don't slap those little paddles on there and shock the hell out of it. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. And that's pretty much all I've got. Listening to Dean Wesley Smith's lecture on this, he talked about how hard it is, even for him as somebody that's been doing this for three decades, almost four decades. He keeps falling off this particular wagon. These are five simple rules that are the hardest thing in the universe to actually keep doing. And it's the a process. one is number one. Well, depends on where you are in the process. Some people have no trouble writing. Oh, I know. I'm just saying the uh, the publication, that whole deal, that whole process is downfall. That's where I get I get in the morass. But the uh, the writing part is what most people just cannot get. Most people cannot get it exactly. So work on that first before worrying about any of this other shit. Write and finish it. If you find yourself not writing, reassess what you're doing wrong. Because no matter what you what you think is important, if you don't have new content, you're not writing. So saith the Terry. So saith the Terry. So let it be written. So let, so it, let be it be done. <laughs> Zoo, come more commandments from Zeus. You trimmed the beard, man. You don't look nearly as as uh, Grizzly Adams. I know. It was a little out of control, so I had to take some of it off. Well, when it started looking like a rhododendron bush that had gone white, yeah, I was kind of... I was going to, you know, see if I could get it, you know, out into the whole pharaoh thing. <laughs> oh, my God, please make that happen. Please <laughs> make that happen. Please. <laughs> I have no, no promises on that one, no. <laughs> All right, folks, if you've got some commentary for us on, on the rules of writing, Highlands rules of writing, and you'd like to share that with us, go ahead and send us a note at show at deadrobotsociety.com. You can find us on Facebook at the listeners of the Dead Robot Society Facebook group. You can find Paul on Twitter at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. You can find our videos at youtube.com forward slash DRS podcast. You can find us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash DRS podcast for as little as a dollar a month. You can get exclusive content there and we're going to have a live show again very shortly. It's going to happen as soon as our scheduler, you know, gets that thing done. I thought you were the scheduler. I'm the general scheduler, but for the live show, that's you. <laughs> I guess I need to get on that. Especially if we're doing it next weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Get on. That would be kind of be important. Where was I in this? If you want to listen to the audio episodes of all 500 plus episodes, we of course have to thank the good folks at podhoster.com who host all of those for your pleasure. And I just saw an email today from somebody that says they're going to catch up on what they've, what they've got going and start back at the beginning. Insanity. Okay. That's what I say. You're insanity. Not, you do not want to listen to those early episodes. <laughs> They're just talking about video games up to episode 100. Trust me yeah, on this. Pretty much, pretty much yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> and of course, if you give to Patreon at the $10 level or more, you get your names read during the show with all of the special stuff that they stick in the middle in the, in the little quotes. Go ahead, Paul. Let's hear what, what insanity the, the patrons have for us today. And our $10 patrons as of this moment are, Sue, you're writing what now, Bayman? Oh, I have some more things to send you some more. You know, is, is, did, does she have, you know, access to your Kanban board? Because I think that if she did, there would be like a heart attack. Probably would be a heart attack. JD Barker, Corey Davison, Kelson Von Deal, Isabel Cushy, Rick penning new words for the first time in months. Shaw. Yay. Welcome back, Rick. Lisa Slack, Sandy Manpants, Cheryl Winters, Tracy Bodine, John Kilgallen, Devin Lee, Nathan is having fun killing Marines Petty. I miss the tongue twisters, dude. Drew has more writing problems than Terry has cats Bernardi. I don't think that's, that's a, possible. That's, that's a lot of problems, buddy. I don't I don't think that's possible, man. If 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 if, if it is, then you need you need to seek help. Chris Winder, Andre Conde Moraes, DJ Chamberlain, and J.R. Handley. Thank you, folks, for supporting us. We deeply appreciate it. You make this show possible. 
Yes, very possible. Oh, Thank you. It's been a pleasure. No, it hasn't. This is that's what's called a polite fiction. Oh, a polite fiction. I wasn't aware we were being polite. I know it's so rare on this show. <laughs> All right. Let's get and out of here. And we are out of here. Thank you, folks. Thank you. See you next week.